you're at the Heliophysics Audified Resonance in Plasmas webinar, and we really appreciate you joining us this Saturday. So let me advance to the next slide. And um, I want to just first start off by um, thanking all of you. Um, thank you so much for all the work you've been doing on this project. You're doing an incredible job. Uh, you know, we wouldn't be able to do this this work without all the hard work you're putting into this. And we already have some really exciting first results on our website. Um, and feel free to check them out. Um, go to listen.spacescience.org uh, to check out those results. You can see some charts here on the left, um, some of the common words that you're using in the notes that you're recording, and also of some of the charts related to the actual results. Um, so you can see our website for first results again. Um, and uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking them, but if there's questions, we can definitely get to them uh, today. But I want to also say that we're a pilot study supported by NASA. And so that means that we're kind of learning as we go on some of these things, especially the, the user interface and tutorials. So we're really using your feedback to improve for follow on projects. And um, so keep the feedback coming. We appreciate it. And, um, you know, some things that we already are very aware of that we want to, to improve in the future are having the capability to use this on a smartphone and tablet, having additional tutorial walkthrough, um, and the ability to go back and review specific events. And so as you get more um, feedback for us, there's other little things that uh, we can get into also that we want to modify, but just keep, keep the feedback coming, basically. So our plan for today is we're going to do a, a brief intro to the science of HARP. We're going to walk you through the interface so you can see um, kind of some of the, the, a little more information than you get in the tutorial about what we're doing and what kind of features we want you to look at. And of course, we're going to try to answer your questions. So please um, go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A um, and we'll, uh, we'll definitely get to them uh, during the course of this webinar. So there's other ways to get involved. I wanted to spend a little bit of time just plugging other NASA um, projects that are looking for volunteers. You can go to science.nasa.gov slash citizen science for some examples of that. But there's a lot of projects there that are closely related to the science that we're working on for HARP. Um, things like studying the the aurora or the northern northern lights, um, northern and southern lights, also studying the sun and different atmospheric phenomena. So check out that website. I did want to plug one um, project in particular. The, the ham radio community has a project called HamSci that's doing projects related to the North American total eclipse in 2024. And Dr. Christina Collins is on, is also a HARP team member. And I just wanted to kick it over to her for a second to see if she has any any words on that. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so HAMSI is a collective of ham radio operators and space scientists that exists to uh, share knowledge between those two groups. And I'm just going to drop a set of links in the chat here. The first one talks about how ham radio relates to space weather. If you'd be interested in setting up your own personal space weather station, uh, there's some information on how to do that. That's a uh, an inexpensive system that we have for community data collection that's worth checking out. And uh, as Mike mentioned, we have the Solar Eclipse QSO parties coming up, which are amateur radio contests. So if you have any interest in ham radio, I hope you'll join us. Thanks a lot, Christina. Um, so yeah, uh, feel free to check out for more, more ways to get involved in NASA research. So for today, um, this is a picture of the HARP team members on the call today. Um, and we're not going to have time to go through introductions for everyone. But as we go through the questions, um, there'll be time for people to introduce themselves. Um, so, But I will just quickly introduce two people that will be presenting just now. Um, uh, Dr. Alessandra Pacini, who's going to talk to us about space weather. And then later, Emmanuel Masongsong is going to talk to us about um, the HARP science. And then we'll come back to the tutorial walkthrough. So I want to just... Um, Introduce Dr. Alessandra Piccini from NOAA. Um, she is going to tell us a little bit about space weather, how the sun affects the nearest space environment, and why that's important for human life and technology. And so she's involved in, an, in a group that's very much involved in trying to understand and predict space weather, which is the connect, really connected with the research that we're doing. It kind of ties in and helps to inform our knowledge of space weather. So I'm going to move to the next slide. And Dr. Piccini, feel free to take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to this group of citizen scientists that are in this field of space weather. And uh, we, we have lots of process happening in the sun, between the sun and earth and around the earth that are very important to our society. And this is not only incredible for physicists like us that are interested on in the beauty of the process and understanding the connections, 
but also to the country and to the protection of our assets in space and also on the ground. Emmanuel is going to talk a little more about the physics about this process, but I want to just bring a little bit of uh, the, the official channel from the United States uh, to, to monitor and to forecast this process. So like we are part of NOAA, which is the National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And we have uh, a constellation of satellites in different orbits that are monitoring and measuring uh, some, some uh, process that happens in the, in the line between the sun and the earth, we call the Lagrangian one point. I don't know, you probably cannot see my mouth, my, my mouse here but we have now one uh, instrument there called discover thank you mike and this is measuring the solar wind so our planet lives in the in this is stars wind the solar wind and everything that happens in the sun can already impact our planet and here on the bottom figure you can see some of the alerts that we have through our space weather prediction center uh, we call SWIPSI, and I, I invite you all to visit the website, uh, www.swipsi.noaa.gov, and you will have reports, daily reports about what is going on in this environment, in the sun, on the earth, and in between, and, why, and how that is impacting our uh, assets here. So you have some alerts that are immediate alerts uh, due to solar flares that are emitting more radiation, but you also have some alerts that are uh, later, that are coming later, so we can we can prevent some impact and mitigate the, the consequences because those are coming through uh, solar ejections, kind of uh, coronal mass ejections, we call CMEs, and we measure the process in between at this Discover uh, satellite. In 2025, we are going to launch a replacement for this satellite called SWIFO, that's the Space Weather Follow-On, mission at L1, and we measure their magnetic field, which is the interplanetary magnetic field. We measure particles, we measure radiation, and we will have also a chronograph that is going to measure the solar corona. And around the Earth, we have satellites in different orbits measuring the space weather process. And one, um, one constellation we call GOES is a, is a constellation that are there since the 70s and keeps measuring and continuously the magnetic field inside what we call magnetosphere and that's where you guys are when you are participating on the harp uh, mission we are measuring fields inside this environment uh, dominated by the the earth's magnetic field which is the magnetosphere so we call this orbit geo orbit which is the geosynchronous orbit that is an equatorial orbit and can see the whole globe also. So we have cameras looking at the Earth, we have cameras looking at the Sun, and we have instruments measuring what's happening around the satellite. We have some other low orbit, um, low Earth, uh, low orbit, uh, uh, low Earth or orbit, which is the LEOs, and uh, those are uh, the the satellites that are measuring some process in the ionosphere. And we have the cosmic, for example, measuring 500 kilometers, more or less. And we have some um, high elliptical orbits, the polar orbits measuring process on the poles. So all of this constellation is helping us to bring data and then to feed our models. And the models are the ones who are gonna give us the, the, the status of the space weather uh, in a few days or in a few hours. And that's part of the information you have on the SWIPC website. At NOAA, we have a group that does the forecast and we have a group that does the science behind and also implementation of the satellite data. So we have two different groups, but we work together and we provide this, this data to the science community, to the, to the citizen science community, and also to the forecasters to provide information to the users. Who are the users of space weather? Are the people who are interested on this process and how that can affect them? So industries like the uh, airplanes, uh, the, the power grids, we have uh, oil and gas. So we have all sorts of, of um, industries that rely on our information. And I will pass the ball to Emmanuel here. He's gonna show us a little bit of the physics behind those process that happens in the sun and around, around the earth. And why is that important to these industries? Thank you. I'm gonna share my screen.
home. Let's go. So thank you, Ali, for that overview. Uh, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more and talk uh, specifically about space weather. Um, so my name is Emmanuel, and I work at UCLA, and I'm a study coordinator with HARP. Uh, so thank you all again for being here. Um, so as you can see here, these are real images from space showing the aurora um, or the northern and southern lights from the space station. Um, so these aurora have mystified people for thousands of years, and we didn't really even know how they worked until the last, say, 100 years or 50 years even. Um, so this is the visible evidence that the sun is influencing our planet um, and uh, sending streams of particles that, that cause the sky to glow. So I'll talk about that more in a, in a few seconds, but um, this is uh, visible, but the rest of what we study is invisible. And like Ali said, we have many, many satellites that can measure what's happening between the sun and earth. So we can see what's happening in the sun, we can see what's happening in the, the aurora, but in between is still uh, really difficult to study. So why do we hear about space? We get a lot of questions of, okay, you guys spend a lot of money sending things up into space, and um, why don't we just spend that money on the ground? Uh, well, our society is incredibly dependent on satellites. Um, anything from GPS uh, for directions, um, airplane communications, um, we have um, the research satellites, the International Space Station, we have astronauts and, of course, more space tourists going up and um, uh, a bunch of research satellites, including James Webb Space Telescope, the Mars rovers. Um, and then weather, of course, is really important um, with all of the climate change if we can't uh, monitor what's happening. Um, so if any one of these assets was to, uh, to go down, uh, we don't have any replacements ready. Um, and even more impacting, um, which I'll talk about later, is uh, the electrical grid on the ground can also be impacted by space. So all this stuff's really important, and we have to find ways to protect it. So it turns out that space weather comes for our star, the sun, and that happens to be the greatest risk to all of our assets in space and uh, uh, to our power grid. So not many people have seen the sun up close. Uh, maybe some of you have since you're... Um, citizen science uh, and uh, enthusiasts of NASA. Uh, but this is actual video footage from the Solar Orbiter, which is a European spacecraft that's flying closer to the sun as we speak. And you can see that right away that there's these loops and kind of brighter regions and then the streaming material that's coming off the sun. So it's blowing off in all directions and we call that the solar wind. So the sun itself is a giant magnet. And as it's spinning, its magnetic field, these lines that surround it can become twisted and um, turbulent, and that can cause uh, areas of increased magnetic activity. As you see on the top right, there's these loops that form wherever there's increased magnetic activity, and those are visible as sunspots. In the bottom right image, there's little black dots. And so these sunspots are prone to erupt, and uh, the magnetism of the sun also uh, accelerates the material that's coming off the sun much uh, uh, faster and hotter than it would be um, just from the thermonuclear uh, uh, explosions inside the sun. So what we study is how this solar wind, that's like winds and storms on Earth, there's winds and storms in the sun. They're blowing out in all directions, hitting all the planets and moons, and all of our satellites are basically um, subject to this material. Um, so this is actual uh, uh, satellite image of the solar wind that's been enhanced. So basically, there's solar storms that happen, and they can happen at any time. So using the, the NOAA satellites and different NASA satellites, we can measure and monitor these eruptions and see whether or not they're going to hit our planet. But when they do hit our planet, um, okay, one more slide. Um, this left slide is, uh, left image is one of the, the coolest things. It's uh, Galileo in the 1600s was the first person to identify these sunspots and draw them uh, day by day, uh, month by month. And he showed that they actually change um, with seasons. So every 11 years, there's an increase in sunspots, an increase in solar activity, and then there's a decrease. So right now, um, if you project from 2014 to 2025, that's 11 years. So we're actually about to enter a period where there'll be much more solar activity, many more solar storms. We've already started to see more aurora and solar flares and that kind of thing. So um, so space weather is something that's that's constantly changing and can impact us on a daily basis. So what happens when that solar wind comes to Earth? 
we have a bubble around our planet, which is a magnetic force field, and the solar wind is impacting that 24 seven. So the sun and the earth are directly connected by electricity and magnetism. So this is a simulation of what earth magnetic bubble looks like and the solar wind blowing over it. So it forms a protective force field and the solar wind mostly blows over us, but sometimes that energy can leak in and that's when we see the auroras. So here is a video of the magnetic field, which looks like strings. Um, so that brings us to our harp analogy that we have these magnetic strings coming out of the earth and there's smaller strings closer to the earth. And there's longer strings that go out way far, um, almost to the moon. So if we flatten this image, uh, we can see uh, the Earth and the strings behind the, the Earth, and the sun would be on the left. So these shorter strings um, basically can vibrate whenever the solar wind hits the Earth. They'll, the shorter strings will vibrate at a higher frequency or higher pitch um, because they're smaller. And the longer strings on the back side of the Earth will vibrate at a lower pitch. Um, so these uh, string vibrations are akin to what we hear on Earth with air vibrating, but in space, this is magnetism vibrating, uh, the magnetic field lines. So this is Earth harp. And so from the short strings, the long strings, uh, we can hear vibrations using satellites. And so this harp is constantly retuning. The strings are changing length. Um, they're vibrating at different uh, times and different uh, um, uh, amounts, so we need to be able to monitor this, and that's what you guys are listening to as part of the Heart Project. So here's a really cool video. Um, this is a simulation um, based on spacecraft data that shows the the harp strings as they're changing, and you can see the sun, the solar wind, just impacted the Earth. All of that yellow and orange material um, is just buffeting Earth's magnetic field, and the harp is responding. So here's another diagram that shows the impacts on the outer edge of the magnetosphere or bubble. And those vibrations can transfer inward and cause the magnetic field lines to vibrate as well. So here's another diagram that shows the same thing. Um, and you have the surface of the magnetosphere can vibrate like a drum. Um, the uh, uh, magnetic field lines inside the earth can vibrate uh, like guitar strings or like um, a flute or clarinet. Um, and then we have different other waves. So the waves that we're mostly interested in are called uh, ultra low frequency waves, and they occur in this region here. So this wave on a string basically can uh, impact space weather through uh, its interactions with particles. So I mentioned the solar wind, there's particles streaming from the sun and they come into contact with Earth's magnetic field. Within Earth's magnetic field, there's even more particles, electrons and protons, which we call plasma and the vibrating field lines can accelerate these particles. So that's where um, our infrastructure is, is put uh, in danger, is that these accelerated particles can damage spacecraft. Um, the uh, solar wind impacts of magnetosphere can block radio communications, so airplanes can't talk to the ground. Uh, and we can also have impacts on our electrical grid. So Themis uh, is the focus of uh, HARP because the satellites orbit close to Earth, and then they go all the way back out to the outer longer strings and then back into the shorter strings. So for the last 16 years, we've been measuring the changing harp strings with this Themis satellite. And so that's really critical is that having spacecraft in the right place at the right time to measure what's happening in space weather um, gives us a picture of what's happening because we can't see it from the ground. We can't use telescopes. Um, so, so Themis has been really, really important and is the, the data that we use in HARP. So, just a quick overview. Um, space weather um, is not only beautiful um, in seeing the sun and the aurora, but it can also cause radio blackouts, um, satellite damage. So if you imagine GPS, your directions don't work, um, drones or automated cars could go haywire. Uh, and then we also have the issue of electric currents in space affecting power lines or even oil and gas pipelines um, under the ground can become corroded and explode from space weather. Um, then we also have this issue of uh, solar storms can make the Earth's atmosphere heat up and expand, and that can cause satellites to uh, slow down and fall out of orbit much faster. Um, so yeah, um, here's a, a just quick overview of drones and the disruption that occurs in our upper atmosphere when you have space weather that impacts communications. Um, the idea of electricity in space 
um, causing currents in pipelines and in the power lines, which can cause them to explode and or rupture. So yeah, that's a really fast overview of space weather. And uh, please uh, ask questions in the Q&A if you want to know more about any of this, and we can also share some links. So thank you very much. Thanks, Manuel. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, and I don't see questions in the chat, but I do see that Irene has had her hand raised for a while. So uh, folks who want to um, ask questions, definitely feel free to put them in the chat because we'll get to them faster. Um, we can actually type a response and also answer them live, but I'll just go ahead and see if Irene uh, wants to ask a question. I think I have to change a setting for that though. Let me do that. Can you so, just cover and, and, and just say a lot of talk? Yeah. And I think I can just do that right now, ask to unmute. So Irene, if you still have your question, you're welcome to to ask it. And while we're waiting, um, yeah, again, if anyone else has questions. I, I made a mistake, sorry. So I apologize. Oh, no worries. Good to, good to hear from you, Irene, and hope, hope things are good uh, in the UK. You're in the UK, right? I'm in the UK. I was just checking that I was connecting up to everyone so that's all it was sorry no worries no worries yeah yep appreciate appreciate you joining um okay cool uh any other uh questions from anyone yeah about space weather or harp um but we'll get to uh more of the harp interface shortly so going once i see a question from dante i'll just uh answer it live and see if anyone else uh wants to ask too so Dante asks, how many space founds have been identified so far? And the answer to that is a huge number. <laughs> um, well, on our on our project, there's been quite a few. Um, I think the number, we can talk about like the number of times people have, have marked off different events and it's, I think in the 10,000s now. Um, but more broadly, um, space sound is like a very broad term. And, it, and when we're talking about it, we're usually talking about um, waves and these kind of charged particles and, and magnetic fields in outer space. And there's a whole bunch of different types that are even outside of the type of event that we're looking at. Um, and they sound like, um, you, some of you might have heard of things like chorus waves and hiss, and these kind of all sound like what what these waves would sound like if you play them through a speaker. So the short answer is there's a huge number um, and there are many different types. And there's a good, there's a nice video on our website and, and I'll try to dig up, dig it up and put it in the chat soon. That kind of does a nice overview of this from our colleague, uh, Martin Archer in the UK. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I see another question. What is waving in the plasma? The direction, okay, so so Noah Zuckman asks, what is waving in the plasma? The direction magnitude of the magnetic field, the plasma density. Um, Shuing, do you want to do you want to try to take that one, or does anyone else want to try to take that one? I think Shane is typing an answer. Uh, oh, great! Do you want to take that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Shane, go ahead and type the answer, and I'll just maybe uh, answer live too, and, and others can chime in. But um, in the type of wave that we're studying, um, definitely the direction and magnitude of the magnetic field. Yes. Um, the magnetic field, if you're sitting out there in outer space and you had a compass in your hand um, and it was sensitive enough, you would see it wiggling back and forth. And um, also if you can measure the magnitude of the magnetic field, that's also changing. Um, and the plasma density is also often changing, although to varying degrees, depending on the type of wave. In the type of measurements that you're looking at, um, those types of waves usually don't, they, they have a density um, change, but they don't always have a big, as big a one as some, some of the other waves that we study is the short answer. But but yeah, everything is changing basically in these waves, the density and the magnetic field. Great question. Uh, does anyone else want to want to add to that? And I know Shane is typing an answer too. Great. Um, and I'm going to start. Okay, yeah, Noah asks another question. What about electrostatic waves? Great question. Yes, uh, there's there's no the, for electrostatic waves you don't need the magnetic field to change, um, but you will see electric field changes. And so um, we haven't in our interface for the for the harp waves, you're not going to see any of those electrostatic waves because we're only looking at magnetic field. Um, but there are higher frequency, um, higher pitch waves uh, that have only the electric field oscillation 
uh, that that would not have a strong molecular oscillation. So 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 short answer to your question, Noah, is that we we don't have the electrostatic waves in our in our interface right now because of because of the instrument that we're using, the measure, type of measurement we're doing. But but definitely there are those waves, and that and you can sonify those waves just like you can sonify the ones that we're looking at um, if you have an electric field measurement. So great questions. And I'm going to start setting up the tutorial uh, window. If, and, but people, if, uh, anyone can feel free to ask questions at any time. And this, the, we're going to kind of transition now to a more, uh, in, I guess, the, no, not really a presentation, but just kind of a walkthrough of the tutorial. So I'm going to share my screen. And and this is a great chance if you want to ask questions that have been bugging you about, you know, what what the heck you're looking at on the interface. I know the tutorial stuff we've put on there is is kind of like not as much as we would like, and we're going to change that in future projects. But um, definitely, we want to have these kinds of back and forth to to go into a little more detail. So I'm going to share my screen right now. And so I'm going to start walking through the tutorial, but we'll have lots of pauses now so that we can um, answer questions. And so the first thing I'll say is I know that some of you, as you've been um, uh, jumping onto the HARP uh, website, uh, might have had issues with the interface. And you know, a lot of the reason for that is that we just um, we were really only testing this on a PC uh, with with like Chrome and Firefox and a few other browsers. So using it on a tablet or smartphone is not ideal right now. And and we definitely want to change that, but it's it's something we're we're probably not going to implement for a little while. Um, and so and then there's another issue I think that's come up with copy pasting passwords. Um, we're trying to get that fixed too. And so there's a couple of little things like that that we're working on basically is the short answer. So, but if you can get to the screen, let's, let's go and see what uh, what happens when you go to practice. So um, if we go to practice, let me click the box here. And actually I just realized I have to um, stop sharing this for a minute because I have to use share zoom with sound. Otherwise you won't be able to hear what I'm when I'm playing. So I'm going to share with sound. OK. And just fair warning for people, um, hopefully this won't be loud as it comes to your speakers, but depending on your volume, it might be a little loud. Or maybe it's too quiet. So just fair warning on that. Um, OK, so uh, I don't know why that's there. So so this is the, the tutorial um, screen. That you start with, and actually, I think I don't know if it it didn't look like it was showing the screen that I'm used to to start with. But anyway, you the way you can do this is you start by um, uh, you can move around on the left here, and this is basically a picture of the um, the Earth and the Sun, and this is showing you the orbit of the spacecraft that we're using, and I can you can reset the camera view at any time um, by clicking that button on the bottom left, and so when you look at the the top here, this chart here, this is basically three days of magnetic field measurements from, would be from a satellite. And this is another way of looking at the data that shows you um, basically when the waves are, when the harp waves are intense, you'll see the color light up on, on this, this type of chart. And basically it's kind of like looking at sheet music if you're musically inclined. So higher pitches will be at near the top of this chart <clears throat> and lower pitches will be near the bottom. And as you move forward from left to right, you're moving forward in time, just like you would if you were playing like piano music or something like that. And if and you'll you'll see that as you as you play the sound, you'll you'll hear the, you know, as this this line kind of goes down, it's kind of like looking at notes going down on sheet music. The pitch is going to get lower. I'll just play it real quick so you can have, hear that as an example. Okay, so what you're looking at again is magnetic field measurements. And this chart gives you information about like sort of how loud uh, the waves would be if they were sound, uh, and and they are sound as we're as we're bringing them to our speakers, or how intense they are in outer space. How how much is the magnetic field vibrating? So if you see really big wiggles, it means they're vibrating a really a, a big lot. You know, like the, the, those strings are moving back and forth quite a bit. Um, this chart again tells you about the the uh, frequency change, and it's. We, we kind of like to use this chart along with the sound to try to pick out the harp waves. So if you remember back to Emmanuel's presentation, the spacecraft is flying through this massive harp in outer space. And as it moves away from the Earth, the pitch gets lower. 
and as it moves back towards the earth, towards the shorter harp strings, because short strings will have a tend to have a higher pitch, the pitch gets higher. And that's why you get this U shape. And this is the this is really the pattern that we're starting with that we want you to try to find to start with. Um, and as you look at real data, this is just a computer generated result. It's not real data yet, not real measurements. But we wanted to start you off with this really simple case so you can see what like the perfect case would look like. And this is like the perfect case where you're moving out of in the harp pitch gets lower as you get to the longer strings and you move back towards the earth and it gets shorter. And then just like any strings, any string instrument, you can have harmonics um, depending on where you pluck the string. And so sometimes you'll see one, two, three harmonics for these harp waves. And that's why we wanted to give you this example to show you what, what happens when you have those harmonics. And then we want to show you this one to, to emphasize that sometimes you see nothing at all. Sometimes there's no, there's no uh, harp event at all. And so what, what we do, is we make a box. Um, the way we, we kind of find events is we, when we see this kind of pattern, this U shape, we want to uh, look for that and then make a box. And we want the box, and this is confusing, I know, uh, so I'm going to spend a little time on this. We want the box to cover the whole line. So so think about it like trying to pick out an ent that entire pass through the harp. What we want you to do is not just do like one like here, and then one like here, and then one like here. Instead, we want you to try to see if there's one, if there is one long continuous pass through this whole harp, we want you to hit the whole thing at once and, and draw your box around the whole, in this case, half U shape. And so once you do that, you can go through and, and make some um, notes on the event. And we like to, um, it, honestly, if you draw the box, that's already like 99% of the battle for us. Like we get a lot of the information we need just by knowing the size of this box because it tells us how much the pitch is changing because we can tell, read off basically from the height of the box and the, the width of the box, like when it's starting and stopping and how the, how the frequency or pitch is changing. But it helps us if you put, put the extra information here too. Like if you can see that it's the pitch is just going down, then putting that down. If you can only see one line, putting just one line. And some people are really good with the sound. So so the sound description and the visual description are really complementary to each other. Some people are going to be really good with visual, like looking at the, 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 the chart here and seeing, oh, I only see one line, and they'll click that. Some people with their ears, they, as you listen to more and more of these events, you'll get a, a better sense of this, but of what a pure tone sounds like. And in this case, this is a pure tone. Basically, pure tone and one line mean the same thing. Um, it's just it's just basically saying the same thing with sound or visual analysis. But you'll get more of an intuition for the sound as you go through more of these events. So this is what a pure tone sounds like. It's just one line on the spectra. Oops, I don't know why it didn't do that. Here we go. And just just um, if you in case you don't um, haven't tried this before, uh, when you once you make a mark, when you hit the play button, the nice thing is that the, the interface will only play you the sound in that box that you've marked. Um, once you finish that, it'll go back to playing the sound in the whole spectrogram. So, so when I listen to that, because I've listened to a lot of these, I know it sounds like a pure tone. But again, when you start off, don't feel like, you're, I know it's going to be confusing. And it's fine if you, if you just go by the marking down the line and just basically click the button that matches that in the sound. But just the short summary here is just do your best. We know that it, it, it's, a, it's a case where you have to kind of build up an intuition as you look at more and more of these events. And if you're not confident, and we'll go through a couple more events where we, we can talk about whether, you know, the lower confidence level events, because there, there are, definitely are a lot of them. If you're not confident, definitely feel free to put, you know, one, two, three, whatever you feel comfortable with. And all of this stuff helps us. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's people are going to disagree on some of these events. Some people are going to say they see events. Some people are going to say they don't. And so the more you can do to, um, you know, mark off events and then tell us your comments level, the more we can help aggregate all that results together from everyone and get a better result overall. So I'm just going to hit submit. So that's an example of making one mark. Um, again, I try to cover the whole thing, uh, the whole continuous line as the satellite sweeps away from the Earth and goes to lower pitches. Um, one thing you might notice is that you can't cross lines, these dashed lines. So that's because it helps us to understand the harp better if you um, are only dealing with a half orbit of the spacecraft at the time. So basically, as the satellite or the spacecraft moves away from the Earth, we want to divide up this segment when it's moving away and split it off and, and separate it from the one where it's moving towards the Earth. 
kind of like you're strumming the harp in one direction, you're strumming the harp in the other direction. If we can split those two off, it's a lot easier for us to analyze. And that's why we don't let you draw a mark that goes across this, this barrier here. So I'm gonna to go to another event here and then I'll pause for questions. I wanna just show you what we want you to do when you have more than one line or, or more than one or, or multiple harmonics. Um, and so again, as you're moving in this big big harp, you can have different harmonics. You can, some events you'll have um, you know, two, one, two, three, four even. And the way we, we would like you to do it is to try to draw a box around everything, the whole thing. So not like this, but actually try to do it around everything. And it's okay if you've done it the other way, you know, like I said, we'll still be able to get useful full results out of that. Um, but we like to have everything covered in the, the same box if we, if we can for our analysis. So when we play the sound, just so you can hear an example again of the, the, the you know, the mix of tones or the multiple tone events with more than one harmonic. So it sounds a little different than the last one. It sounds, and again, like I said, you'll get an intuition for this because if you don't hear a difference between what I played earlier, it's fine. But as you listen to more of these, you'll, you'll definitely get an intuition for what um, a mix of tones sounds like versus a pure tone. Play it one more time. So in this case, since the pitch is going down, I put just go down and I see multiple lines and I, I hear a mix of tones. And for me, I'm going to say, okay, I'm pretty confident because this is sort of a computer generated model. Um, so I'll do that. And I can say like um, multiple, you can write anything you want in these boxes. And we, and I want to say again, we really appreciate all that you're doing. We, some of you have been really verbose and like writing a ton of stuff and it's great. We love that. Um, it really helps us. And it's already helped us identify some of the events that are, that are like kind of like people were confused about them. They weren't sure if this was a harp event or not. And they wrote a note about like, okay, I think this is this. That helps us a lot actually, because we can, when we see lots of people writing notes on those kinds of events, it helps us to bring everything together and focus on those events only. And, and then we learn something about them. So I can say some notes here. I saw multiple lines. So that's kind of the, e so this is like the easy case. This is again, the first thing you see in our tutorial or sh that you should see in our tutorial, it's just computer generated um, data for like what the perfect scenario is when you when you see the ideal harp event. I'm just gonna pause real quick and see if there's any questions before I go on to some of the, the, the real uh, data. And I don't see any questions right now. I'm gonna make sure I've answered some of the questions that have come in over email before I move on actually. So there was questions about um, oh, Stephen asks, I don't understand how our participation helps. Okay, great question. Um, what we want from you is to help us to find patterns like what I'm showing you here, but also to give us um, a sense of the patterns that we weren't expecting. So, and the type of, and the wave research that we're working on right now, these, these magnetic vibrations or these harp events, there are longstanding um, puzzles and, and disagreements in the scientific literature about how often they occur and where they occur. And one of the reasons we have these challenges is that when a single researcher looks at, looks for this kind of event, they, they kind of design an automated detection algorithm and immediately that introduces sort of the biases of that researcher. And, you know, you have these studies that are kind of, because this pattern um, isn't always very well, um, uh, well formed, like it's not always like this ideal case, we don't have a good way of just automate, automatically detecting it with a computer. And so there's these disagreements in the literature. And I think uh, the big reason for the, these disagreements is that it's usually just one person looking for these, these patterns. And so the way you're helping us is, you know, you and others helping are helping us is by looking through a large number of these events and actually not just using a computer to, you know, like we, what we would do is look at a couple of these, maybe 10, 20, 100, and then make a computer algorithm that does the detection. But by having a large number of people look at a lot of this event, a lot of these events and picking out um, sort of borderline cases and telling us when they see something that sort of looks like that, but has a little bit of a feature that's different. You know, maybe maybe the the pitch change isn't as big. Maybe the pitch change doesn't go in the same direction the whole time. That helps us a lot. It helps us to 
um, kind of refine our computer detection algorithms. And by bringing your perspective and everyone else's perspective together, that also really helps us because usually it's just one or two people doing this kind of research. And so, so you're not really, um, you're definitely helping us by looking for the classic harp pattern. You know, the one that I'm showing you here where it's just like a U ship going down, but honestly, um, if it was this easy all the time, a computer could do it. The reason we need your help is because it's not always this easy. And I'm sure you've seen as you look through some of these events that it's a lot of a lot of edge cases, a lot of borderline cases. And so that's kind of helping us to find not only the patterns we expect, but that we don't expect for these these events. Um, I don't know. Does anyone else from the Harp team want to chime in on that or answer uh, add any any more information to this? Yeah, I, I just wonder. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, I'll go and then you go. Um, so in my PhD research, we were doing comparisons of the capabilities of auditory analysis and visual analysis. One thing that we found was that listening to data, we generally have this higher sensitivity, whereby we're more likely to actually identify something that's not there and give a false positive. But in the same respect, we're also more likely to find something that may be overlooked, um, hear something that may be overlooked. Um, and visual analysis is so ubiquitous within the sciences that often we'll kind of mix up the language. And when we're listening to data, we'll often say like, oh yeah, I saw something there when we meant to say, I heard something there. So this really is some cutting edge research. And we can think about our ears as very high resolution spectral analyzers. And when you walk down the hallways of somewhere like NASA Goddard, you'll see lots of visual spectrums. And like what we're looking at here, which it's got the little harp swoop there, Oftentimes, that's all that you get um, throughout, you know, 99.9% .9 of the sciences. And so one of the big parts of the cutting edge work that we're doing here is to take the high sensitivity of the ear and the fact that we are able to find features that are sometimes overlooked and say, what are we able to find? And there is so much data that's out there um, that it is possible for a lot of things to, to go missing or unobserved. Um, and so we're picking up a lot of those events through research like this. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, great point. Go ahead, Chung. Oh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I'm about to make the same point here that, yeah, so if we can put a note in a comment about what you hear, you think it's not how about something new, basically just to have us identify new new things or new harps or new outcome of waves is also very helpful for this project as well. So the same comment. Great points, yeah, and, and yeah, that's. A, I'm glad you you both brought up the audio too. Like that, that is a key part of this. That um, it we've we've shown, and Robert has shown in his his PhD work, and also um, in a recent publication um, for a related project on this very similar type of waves. Um, the fact that you combine the visual and the audio analysis, and and the audio analysis in particular, really lets you pick out um, new aspects of these patterns that we didn't see before. And so, so it's definitely cutting edge, and it's new, and we haven't haven't really done this before. Um, but it's it's the, and the little bit that we have done in it has yielded really interesting results and new results. Um, okay, so I see some other questions. Let's see, what's should we do? Lisa Stiller's question. Oh, th thanks. Yeah, that's just a comment. Yeah, we appreciate your comment, Lisa. Um, that that uh, we're using both sound and visual and. You know, I'll, I'll just say one comment we get a lot with the the um, sound analysis or audio analysis is that um, this would be really great to work with some other communities that don't interact with data visually, uh, like the blind and low vision community. So that is one thing that we want to do in the future, for sure, to, to, to kind of adapt this to a fully, fully just audio analysis. Um, and I see another question from Noah. Sometimes I would get brief high pitch waves that are mostly constant in frequency, maybe drifting up or down a little. Any idea what these might be? Yeah, that's a great question. And I maybe I can move on to another event. But when you see, um, when in doubt, uh, when you see something on these spectra, uh, if you see something that looks like a high pitch noise that might possibly be a harp, usually if it's near the top of the spectra, it's not because even though there is a lot of variability from one day to the next on like the pitches that you'll see, the harp events tend to be, you know, sort of near the 
clustering near the bottom of the spectra. At the top of the spectra, though, there's other types of waves that can occur. And there's, um, if it's a really high pitched kind of like whine, um, it might be a satellite instrumentation artifact. So there are some, so, so I'll just, I'll back up for a second and say that, you know, measurements are messy and science is messy. So measurements are messy. The, the magnetic field measurements um, that the spacecraft make, we try to clean as many of the artifacts out as possible, but making a measurement in outer space is always bound to have difficulties. So one difficulty with magnetic field measurements is that you can have some noise coming from the spacecraft itself. And if you see a really, really thin line, like a really thin line that's kind of like going up and down here or, or just flat, chances are it's 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 an artifact. It's a it's basically the magnetic field measurement isn't functioning like it's supposed to. But there are other things that can happen near the top of the spectra that that might be also what you're seeing. Um, and I, I'm going to try to find an example if I can, maybe on the next event. But I think uh, if are they harp waves? They're probably not harp waves, but they might be another type of wave that we would like to study. And I think what I would encourage people to do is if you see something that looks really interesting, but you don't think it's a harp event, just draw a box around it. And then when you see the, the, your confidence level, put like a one or something. And so that's, we, we, we take that information into account. And then if you write a note, like, I don't think this is a harp event. I think it might be something else you should look at. Yes, we, we would really love for you to do that. And that would be very helpful for us. Um, so, so, but, but to answer your question more directly, Noah, it's probably either, um, it could be contamination to the measurement, or it could be another type of wave we call, um, uh, an ion cyclotron wave, which is a fancy way of saying that it's, it's basically, uh, something that's a little bit smaller scale and it relates to, um, an interaction between the plasma and the magnetic field and, 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 the uh, electric field. So there's another type of wave, not related to heart, but also very interesting and very important for space weather. So it could be either of those things, contamination or ion cyclotron wave. Yeah, and I, I need to get- highlight something okay. real quick that, yeah, I mean, as scientists um, see some of these these uh, things that we're like, oh, that's definitely not a harp or definitely not something that we're interested in, but we could be wrong. So it's really important that when you pick out um, as citizen scientists, things that a uh, scientist might overlook, um, we might take a second look at it, be actually that was important. So your observations are are actually uh, really helpful. Thanks, Mia, much appreciated. And I'm gonna try to find um, an event. Let's see, I'll just go to a real event now. Okay, this has some stuff, good. So so um, it doesn't have the clearest example of one of those other higher pitch waves that um, that we've seen that we were just talking about, but it does have some examples like this. This is an example, um, usually these lines are faint, but um, when you see a really flat line like this, this is most likely something artificial. And to try to give you a little more information, these things are gonna tend to occur near the very top of this chart. And they're gonna be very different from the naturally occurring plasma waves. They're gonna be like either exactly flat or they're gonna have like, you know, very strange, like um, really narrow compared to this and, and um, rapidly changing variations. And they'll hear they'll sound like a high pitch whine. Um, there's other types of waves like these little blips th that might be real, and I, I'll try to find a better example of them. But I see other questions coming in, and maybe let me see if we can look at those real quick. A non-normal anomalous example. Yes. So so question from um, Dianc Luzner, which is, can you show us a non-normal anomalous example? So so yeah, to answer your question, this is one example of a non-normal anomalous example. It's it's an artifact, uh, or it's, sorry, it's um, basically the measurement isn't working like it's supposed to. So you'll see a very flat, very, the, the way to distinguish these from the harp events is that they're very narrow. They look very narrow and, and sometimes they'll be in harmonics like this and they're usually near the top of the chart. So you don't have to mark this off, but if you did, you could say not very, if you weren't sure, you could say not very confident. And I think this might, or I'm not sure what this, you could just say, I'm not sure what this is if you wanted to. And again, we'll take that into account. Um, the not very confidence, we'll, we'll, we'll take that into account. And then if we see lots of people marking the same event, it helps us to come back and look at that and actually confirm that it is a magnetic, a, you know, a magnetic field um, contamination impact and not a real event. So I'm gonna cancel that for now. Um, I wanna show another example though with a, with a um, uh, something where there is actually one of those real events at the top of the spectrum. I might have to go through a couple of them but um, before I do that, I'll just give one more example of, of what you 
will do when you see a real event. So this is what real data looks like now. You're looking at real data, and I'm sure a lot of you have already scrolled through this in the, in the user interface. And you know, it's not this nice clean thing where you have, like we had in our computer generated example, it's got you know all kinds of different um, wiggles here with different different intensities, and there's lots of noise. So again, getting back to what Robert was saying earlier, it really helps. And the really different thing here is we're using visual and audio. And so when things get really messy, like here, um, like I can kind of see these two lines in the spectra here, and I would say, oh, maybe that's a harp event, and I mark it off like I did earlier in the example. But if I listen to it too, let me start from the beginning. I can kind of hear something going on earlier, even though I can't really see because these waves are boring together and all, there's all this background noise. So I might, you know, if I feel comfortable, go ahead and mark the whole thing here because not because of the visual, because I can't see really see very well what's happening, but I heard that continuous kind of upgoing pitch. Um, so I would do something like this. I would say mix of tones, I'd say multiple lines and I might be like, okay, I'm not that confident. Maybe it's a three. Um, I think the waves start early, but I'm not sure. Someone else though, who looks at this might just go ahead and mark only this bit. And, and, and that's fine. You know, I think that it's on us, you know, as, as the harp team to kind of aggregate all of this together. And, and so like, it's okay if you're not gonna all agree on the same event. Um, we'll, we'll definitely take that into account and we'll, we'll use that information. Um, so, so yeah, uh, we, we really appreciate you just taking notes and, and marking things that look different. Um, and if you, and one, one last tip here, if you haven't played with it, you can change the, the scale on this by, by using this button. And so sometimes that might help you see some things more easy, more easily visually as well. Um, so if you click this button, you'll change to different scales. Let me, um, people feel free to keep asking questions. I'm going to try to go to another event where I can try to find another anomalous um, example for people. Oh, good. This this has some that might be like that. So, so a lot of times you'll for these this ion cyclotron wave I mentioned this this type of higher pitch wave that doesn't really look like a harp event. You will see them um, sometimes much more clearly than this. But this is one example I think that is an ion cyclotron wave, and perhaps also this. So these these waves. Um, are also very much generated by the sun and the solar wind that um, Emmanuel was mentioning earlier, but they have they don't always last as long as the harp events, and they have a higher pitch, and they're basically just generated through a different way. They're not really like a musical instrument, but they tend to have higher pitches, and and you know you'll see them at the top of the spectrum. I'm going to play one one sound here. So this is what I'm talking about right here. If I can draw a box around it. And yeah, you, you might say it stays the same. You might say you could, you, so again, we didn't design the interface to look for these waves. So some of these buttons don't make a whole lot of sense for them, but, but it's okay. Like you can, you can um, again, I would say put not very confident. Um, if, you wanna, if you wanna call our attention to something like this, just say not very confident, do your best to answer these other things. Again, they might not make a lot of sense for, for this wave mode that's different than what we're studying, but, but you can say, I think this is something different. And and that's fine. So if you see something, so basically we don't need you to tell us if there's kind of like just random noise like this, but if you see some really queer, queerly isolated like lines or, or patterns in the spectra and you want to call your attention our attention to it, please do. I mean, just, just say you're not very confident that it's a harp event and then write a note and, and we're, we're happy to look at that. And we will, we are actually working with another professor at, at um, um, University of Colorado in Boulder who's very interested in these types of waves. And that's something we might be focusing on in a follow-on project. So, so as you're going through this stuff, definitely focus on that U-shape pattern, which is the one that we want to really look at for our research, but, but feel free to mark other things too. Um, and I see a question, another question from Noah. Uh, how come the orbit of the satellite is kind of wobbly around the far end of the orbit instead of staying in a constant plane? That is an excellent question, and it's something <laughs> that we've we talked about this internally actually before we released our GUI. So, um, and I'll I'm, I'll just quickly take this, and if others want to jump in, but basically, it's the way that we're recording the satellite position is that is um, 
not the way you would if you could see the satellite like if you were if you were standing on the earth's north pole like way up high up in altitude and looking down on the earth uh or looking at it from the side like this i should probably better look at it from the side so if you're looking at the earth from the side um and you were actually looking at the satellite it would not have these distorted shapes it would be a flat ellipse basically going around in its orbit the reason it looks like this is because we're using what we call a different coordinate system a different way of recording the satellite's position that has to do with the Earth's magnetic field. So these are these are magnetic vibrations, and and we often use, we often look at these waves in a system that depends on the Earth's magnetic field. And because the Earth's uh, magnetic field is tilted, you get some of these these weird distortions. And so you would not see this if you could if you were actually standing you know away from the Earth and looking at the satellite's orbit like this. If you could do that, it would just look like a flat ellipse. But it's because of it's because we're using this magnetic. Um, we're organizing the satellite location according to its magnetic position and magnetic coordinates. That's why it's a little different. I don't know if anyone has on the Harp team has a better explanation than that or a better way of saying it. But feel free to jump in or or add to it. But I think the short the to follow up on that. Um, in the future iteration of this interface, um, because we did talk about this, it's kind of confusing. Even though we're going to an analyze the measurements or the, the results in these in the system, I think in a future version of the interface, you'll see a more intuitive result, um, and you'll have the option to look at that other system where it would actually be like what you would see if you were looking at the satellite if you were standing out there. So, great, great question. Um, yeah, and I see we're getting towards the end of the hour, um, so. Maybe I'll just see if uh, if there's any last questions, um, or if any other Harp team members want to chime in with any any questions or comments. Uh, while we are waiting for, okay, I see we have one more question. Maybe we we'll go through that question first. Oh, that's just a thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, thank thank you, um, Ronan. We appreciate your comments. Yeah. And we'll and I'll just really quickly say this is not the last webinar. There's you probably saw in the emails we sent out. There's going to be other webinars organized by NASA and SciStarter. We also with our team will will have follow up webinars and do more deep dives into the science and also update you on the results as they come in. So look out for more announcements probably later this summer. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you for for coming. So go ahead, go ahead, showing. Oh yeah, I just uh, see that we have one more question from, from probably from email, like if the audio can be downloaded available or how to generate different audio format. And do you want to take that question or um why don't you so 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 yeah, I'll just quickly say that we have we have the audio. If you want to play around with the audio files, we have um them available for download. And we can make other formats. And and actually, Shul, um, I should introduce her. Dr. Shuling Shui is just talking uh, from Virginia Tech. Led the software and data processing effort for this, and has has publicly available software that you can use. So, Shuling, do you want to say anything else about the the audio processing? Uh, uh, yeah, I seem to see maybe uh, some of the users want to collaborate or want to have access to that. I think def definitely we can make that available. We already have have that be pre generated. And uh, also we have the software I just post in you know, GitHub repo read, uh, written in Python, which you can use that to generate uh, relevant uh, hub audios as well as those uh, plots showing in the GUI as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, just uh, post your question or issues in GitHub or just email us if you want, want some access to, to the audios or the, the plots. Thank you very much. And on that note, I'll also maybe ask Robert to quickly say a few words about NASA's CDA web, because you can mess around on there with audio as well. Um, do you want to say anything about that, Robert? The um... Yeah. So the Coordinated Data Analysis web is a repository run uh, by Bobby Candy out of NASA Goddard, um, and it has a vast array of satellite data. Um, so if you want to listen to collisions of particles with instruments in the rings of Saturn, um, you can go in. Traditionally, for you know decades, it's only been visual plots that are available, but more recently, we've added in the ability to download audio. So when you get to the final page, you can just, rather than clicking uh, plot visuals, click download audio. I think it defaults to a sampling rate of around 11,000 hertz, but then you just download that on your computer, 
Um, there's some different software like Audacity where you can change the sampling rate, which is going to change the playback speed. If you go to a higher sampling rate, it's going to play back faster. And you're going to hear things that are like smaller temporal regions, lower sampling rate, it'll play back slower. So it's like taking a record and slowing it down. And now you're listening to the kind of lower frequencies and um, yeah, it's uh, higher frequencies, but uh, you can dive in and explore all different types of data that NASA has gathered over the years. Yeah, Robert, I just dropped it in the chat, the, the link for see the web. And uh, I recommend you, you all go in there and then selecting, for example, goals, satellite and magnetic fields from space. And then you go and choose one satellite and one date. And you will see that the conversion of this high resolution, it's a 10 hertz uh, data resolution, time resolution, converting one day in, in a few minutes of audio. That's another advantage of using the audification to analyze data. And then you can hear all the conversion in sound of this data from magnetic fields in the space in, at the geo orbit. That's very cool. Yeah, definitely. And I think we should have a longer, maybe one of the future webinars will definitely walk through some of these audio analysis tools if, if people want to look at other, uh, use audio analysis for other data sets, because there's a lot of tools out there. Um, and it's very, it's relatively straightforward. You'd be surprised how easy it is to do this um, once you get the tools going. Um, and I just, I saw a couple other questions come in. Yeah, good questions. Well, maybe let's take them real quick. So Dante's question, can I go back to a specific data of HARP event? Um, yeah. I, so the short answer, unfortunately, is no. Um, we want to implement that feature, um, and it, but it's probably not going to come until we um, we have the next uh, uh, version of our interface. So right now, the answer is no, unfortunately. So sorry about that, but we'll, we'll, we'll improve it in the future. Um, and then I see one other question from Nicola. Uh, is there an explanation of why the sun experiences maximum and minimum activity approximately every 11 years? I don't know if Emmanuel or Ali or, or someone else wants to take that, Any, or otherwise I can take it up, up to you. The short answer is the jury's still out, but did anyone want to add in more detail? Yeah, it, we can at least say that there, it is related to the sun's magnetic field, right? There's a, there's a, the sun's magnetic field actually flips back and forth every 11 years. And so, um, there is definitely, a, uh, something going on inside the sun that's causing that field to flip. And the jury, I think that there's an active research on that, I believe. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the sunspots that I mentioned, um, they're increasing right now. They tend to emerge near the equator and then they drift upwards in latitude over time um, around when the, the field then flips and then the sunspots kind of sink back down. And then there's no sunspots for a while, and then they reemerge at the equator. So we've been monitoring this pattern, um, but there's, there's several hypotheses of how this could be happening. There's multiple layers of magnetic fields that could be interacting and different cycles that are interacting so um but that's a very uh, tough question to answer yeah yeah it's, it's maybe worth pointing out that because we always use those pictures of bar magnets right and that the sun's magnetic field is not a permanent magnet any more than the earth's magnetic field is it's generated by a dynamo and the earth's magnetic field flips on longer time scales as well so it's um, the fact that the field is being generated by electrical currents in the core uh, means that it's dynamic and it can change over time. Yep, great points. And that the Earth's magnetic field is also another can of worms, right? There's a, it's not predicted, you know, when exactly the flip will be. And yeah, it's a challenging area of research. Um, I see a couple other quick questions, or at least one other from Stephen uh, for Ollie. Could you describe again the blue and red orbits on your presentation? Let me bring that up real quick uh, for you. Yeah, I was trying to find the the image again. Stephen, I think they are just showing what is the geo orbit, which is this geosynchronous, uh, geostationary orbit where the gold satellites are, which is an equator. It's around the equator, and uh, you can you can ha you rotate together with the Earth. So it's kind of like the satellites on the top of your head all the time doesn't move because you are moving with the same the same um, duration as the day as, as the Earth day. And the red ones are just showing the near polar orbit satellites. So those are uh, orbits around like 800 kilometers, 840. And they pass, it's a high elliptical orbit we call, and it's passing through the, to monitor the polar regions. So those are very important for uh, measuring these precipitating electrons and particles during auroras and, and things like that. So we have those, and we have also LEO, 
um, satellites which are closer in different orbits and inclination. And those are measuring, those are doing, um, we call ionospheric occultation, radio occultation, and measuring some properties of the ionosphere of the Earth. So all of those are, uh, the geo-orbit is cool because it's inside this magnetosphere, but sometimes the solar wind and the, the interaction with the solar wind is so dramatic that actually our whole magnetic field comes in, like you, you get compressed, and then the satellite that get exposed to the solar wind. So those are geomagnetic crossings, we call, and we can measure that with, with the fields also. So if you go to gold satellites and magnetic fields in the CEDA web, for example, you can hear uh, the audification of these measurements, which are very, very cool. And we have measurements since the 70s, which also allows us to study long-term uh, chains. Great, thanks, thanks, Ali. So yeah, thank you everyone um, so much for coming and thanks for all the great questions. And we'll, we'll definitely have follow-up discussions with you all and we really appreciate your time. And again, I just wanna thank you all for all the work you're doing, um, all the help you're doing with this. And we'll keep you in the loop as we move towards um, writing this up for a publication. So look out for more, more updates soon. Um, but otherwise, uh, stay tuned for more announcements of other webinars from ourselves and also from NASA. And I hope everyone has a great weekend. And we're looking forward to continuing to work with you all. And thanks all for the HARP team members who came on today as well. I appreciate your time. So.